Hi there. My name is Nate Pike, and I'm the host of The Breakdown. A couple of years ago, when we started The Breakdown Up, we did so with a couple of goals in mind. One of those goals was to help uh, raise awareness about Alberta politics in general, because a lot of it is very much inside baseball. We also wanted to make a few jokes along the way, and we also wanted to raise the profile of not only some voices that wouldn't necessarily get heard, but we also wanted to try to raise the profile of some issues that wouldn't necessarily get the full attention that at least we believe that they deserve. Now, there was a protest that was scheduled today, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, the organizers of that protest recognized that it wouldn't be responsible to hold a protest outside in a crowd right now. So we're very, very th pleased that the, they asked us to be a part of helping to bring the presentation that you're going to see uh, to you tonight. So uh, the community YYC, Inclusive Canada and Alberta protests reached out to us and asked if we'd be willing to help produce something. So that's what you're going to watch tonight. Um, there's a bunch of different speakers that are going to be speaking to a bunch of different issues. And every single one of those issues is very, very important. So we would ask you to Watch the program, listen to what these people are, are trying to say, uh, listen to the messages that they're trying to convey, and then think about what you can do uh, to help elevate whatever, whichever of those issues resonates with you. Uh, we've got a bunch of different speakers from all across Alberta, and we're going to kick them off with uh, my co-host, Aliyah Coleman, who's going to be talking about uh, the current state of EMS in Alberta. So with all the discussion that's been going on lately uh, surrounding EMS dispatch systems over the last few weeks, there's been uh, some very important things that have gone overlooked. So first, if you weren't aware, Health Minister Tyler Shandro recently effectively cancelled a contract with multiple municipalities that had seen them handling the dispatching of ambulances within their own cities. This cancellation not only came significantly earlier than anticipated and not only costed people their jobs and their livelihoods, but it also raised the very serious question uh, about whether or not the quality of dispatching services would be affected as a result. But it also did something else. It more or less completely overshadowed two very important stories uh, that need to be told. The first came on October 15th, and it highlighted the fact that in Calgary alone, uh, there were 116 days last year where, for varying lengths of time, the city of Calgary hit what's referred to as a red alert. A red alert is when there are no ambulances available, and at least one of these red alerts lasted for over an hour straight. There were no ambulances available to serve a city of well over a million people for a full hour. So historically, uh, the province has been responding to these sort of situations by saying, there's always an ambulance available. And while that's technically true, it's a clever bit of wordplay because it doesn't disclose the fact that the available ambulance could be coming from a town a long ways away from its call and that that ambulance is leaving a town that leaves it with no protection. And as if that news wasn't bad enough, the news we got on October 20th that things are even worse than that for our hardworking paramedics. CBC News received a copy of a document that detailed some of the concerns that paramedics in Calgary have been trying to bring forward for years. And not only are they absolutely heartbreaking to read, they paint a picture of a workforce pushed to the edge and beyond. The same sentiment was echoed in our interview with City Councillor Jayoti Gondek, who made it clear that she has very deep concerns about the change in the dispatch model. Red alerts and the well-being of paramedics is where she believes the province should be focusing their energies when it comes to EMS in Alberta. And from all of us at the breakdown to every hardworking paramedic, we just want to say that we appreciate the critically important work that you do and that we just want to say thank you. The message I am coming to you today with is simple that it is in the best interest of our province to continue providing Albertans with the assured income and health coverages that are granted to folks like myself under the AGE program. Please do not cut us off. This is a direct attack on the most vulnerable of Alberta. We are being set up to get bamboozled into private health insurance buy-ins and poor health outcomes. The proposed changes do not sit right with me because I know that many families with children that have complex 
healthcare needs just will be overwhelmed to the point of exhausting all their energy. I am certain that if the proposed changes that the UCP government is making to eligibility requirements for the AISH program, if they were to come in effect, would cost us millions of dollars more in recovering from the detrimental effects that would result for disabled Albertans. Those that are in the greatest need are like myself. I have two lifelong medical conditions that require self-sustaining medication, for which now I will require a biosimilar under the new forced biosimilar policy, something that may not fare well for me. My health is not up for chance. I promise to advocate for myself and others living with health challenges. I have struggled so hard for my health to now uncover the mere fact that due to your policies, I will be endangered because of changes to my coverage for medicines. I pose this question to Mr. Kinney, the Honorable Premier Kenny. Do you recognize that without adequate coverage and insured com income, tens of thousands of people will suffer a miserable fate? Some predictions of the repercussions of such policy are that there will be a dramatic rise in homelessness. Most certainly, crime will climb. The excess influx of COVID-19 and an already overburdened healthcare system in Alberta, coupled with a lack of feasible options to good healthcare in our rural communities, make for a deadly life in Alberta. The cuts to coverage of medical supplies, medicines, will leave communities unable to remain safe in this pandemic. The present reality poses endless questions in the minds of Albertans. This uncertainty has been met with layoffs and an unprecedented recession in Alberta. This is not the time to be making changes to health subsidy programs. The question I pose to you, Mr. Kinney, is where are the jobs that have been promised to Albertans? Does your party not have answers? Where is that fiscal accountability on your end? The groups that are the most vulnerable in Alberta need to have greater equity within our province to be able to sustain themselves. The AISH program has been historically one such methodology offering such equity in a successful program. It has been providing aid to the most deserving groups. The eligibility requirements presently are covering for all the groups that fit into a serious debilitating diagnosis. There is a need for greater research on your end to better understand what is truly taking place. Our communities are exercising their right to protest arbitrary, unfair changes. Please listen to them. Do not turn deaf, dumb, and blind to their struggle. The UCP signed on as a government that would safeguard Albertans' interests. You need to do some fact-checking and dedicate yourself to public health policies that reflect the public interest. Deliver on your promises to Albertans first. We can then have dialogue about healthcare resources funding. Sincerely, Sophia Khan. Hi there, my name is Zoe and I'm here to talk about harm reduction and the need to protect it from being dismantled by the UCP government and from Jason Kenney. Currently, Jason Kenney is defunding, restricting access, and closing harm reduction services here in Alberta, such as the IOT OAT program from Sheldon Schrumer, the virtual opiate dependency program, and the 
safe consumption site in Lethbridge. Jason Kenny has done this under some incorrect assumptions. Um, first of all, the assumption that an abstinence-based perspective on recovery works completely independently from a harm reduction um, perspective, when in fact they work together to provide a cohesive solution that meets an individual at wherever, wherever they are at in their journey. There's another assumption that addiction is a choice and that can, people can choose to act correctly. Um, and the people that choose to seek treatment should be the only people that um, get our care in focus. Um, even though when it's scientifically proven that addiction is a mental health disorder with a biological basis. Um, and finally, that harm reduction enables addiction, um, even though it is part of trauma-informed care and is evidence-based. Um, all these assumptions um, kind of root from the misunderstanding on how um, a person develops addiction and, you know, the pathway to recovery um, from there. Trauma is one of the most important underlining factors of a individual developing addiction. Um, this means that it could be biological, so head hits um, where there is direct brain damage. Um, it could be psychological, such as growing up in um, an abusive household or any other types of prolonged trauma. Um, and it could be societal, such as systemic racism and poverty. Um, when we go through trauma, our brains release this hormone called um, cortisol. And when we go through prolonged trauma, so trauma after trauma after trauma, this cortisol actually starts to destroy parts of our brain. Um, Parts like the hippocampus, which is our center for learning and memory, and parts like the prefrontal cortex, um, which um, regulates our emotion and impulse control um, and our thoughts, um, kind of our reasoning and logic center. Um, so individuals that have been traumatized um, are at a reduced capability of um, learning, of memory, of regulating emotions, of impulse controls, which makes these individuals very susceptible to high-risk behaviors such as illicit, illicit substance use. Um, and these damaged parts of the brain um, kind of hinder individuals from healthy, forming healthy relationships. Um, so now that we kind of understand how addiction develops in individuals, we must consider how we're going to get this isolated, traumatized individual into pursuing recovery and whatever recovery looks like for them. That could mean reduction and low risk consumption. It could mean drug replacement therapy, or it could mean abstinence based programming, whatever that person feels like would make the best them. Um, so now Kenny says that individuals um, should choose the right decision and have a superior moral judgment to get oneself into treatment. Um, what harm reduction recognizes is that um, making decisions in regarding self-actualization and regarding becoming a better um, person, these individuals while choosing those decisions would have to use brain areas that need, you know, use learning, memory, emotional regulation, and impulse control. So in essence, these decisions means that the, yeah, that individual needs to reactivate synaptic pathways that have been pruned in parts of the brain that have been damaged. Um, and this can take years. And even when it does take place, it also can only happen in the right environment. And finally, it cannot happen when these individuals are dead. Um, 
So harm reduction provides individuals with chronic addictions comprehensive care that considers um, biological, psychological, and social needs of each individual. It allows us to keep these individual alive enough so we can teach them the foundations of healthy living. Um, harm reduction also recreate, um, creates a network of healthy interpersonal relationships um, for that individual, which allows them to feel accepted. And subsequently, that also deconstructs shame and stigma um, surrounding addiction. Um, and then in turn, these healthy relationships first of all, boost confidence and it allows an individual to feel like they deserve a better life, to deserve better people around them, um, to just deserve better for themselves. Um, but also these healthy relationships rehabilitate and grow damaged parts of the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex. Um, and that reverses the effects of trauma and addiction. So removing harm reduction services is deciding to leave these individuals alone without support and at a higher risk for dying um, an addiction related death. Right now we are in an opiate epidemic. And that is really big. And we're not getting daily updates about it. But there are more people dying of opiate related deaths than there are of COVID. And what is Jason Kenny is doing is removing all our supports um, to solve this epidemic. And I'm unsure why he's doing that and leaving people to die. And because he's allowing, you know, opiate mortality rates to skyrocket, he is perpetuating trauma in an already really vulnerable community. Um, and I think it's just time that we really push um, that trauma-informed care, and that includes harm reduction, is an absolute necessity to solve this problem. So I think that's um, kind of it for me yammering. Um, but if you have um, resonated with anything I say, please reach out to your MLA. Um, we need to be heard and we need to be heard loudly that this will not be acceptable and that we want the best for our communities and we won't just stand by and watch this devastation happen. Hi, I'm Liz and I'm one of the co-creators of AlbertaProtest.ca. Happy International Human Rights Day, and thanks for joining the online event. I'm here to talk to you about a couple of things, and the first is how to go about filing a human rights complaint. I'm not going to go into super in-depth details because that would probably take an eternity, but just to give you a few insights and tips on a few really important things that a lot of people aren't aware of. Now, these are more important than ever because due to some of the changes that the UCP government has made, making these kinds of complaints are becoming a little more difficult and it's entirely possible that they'll become more difficult still. So it's really important to make sure that they're reported because they are a publicly available statistic. So it's something that the government can't shy away from. Now, um, one thing that I would encourage all of you to do today, whether or not you believe that you've been subject to a human rights violation or not, is go to albertahumanrights.ab.ca and go look up the nine protected grounds. So these are entirely what a human rights complaint would be based off of. So you need to look up the nine protected grounds protected grounds and familiarize yourself with them. So even if you haven't been subject to a violation in the past, you'll know if it happens in the future without being unsure. So definitely go and do that. And this is also really important because if you do go to file a complaint, you really need to be absolutely clear on which ground was violated and more specifically how it was violated.
So another really important thing to be aware of is that you only have one year from the date of the incident to file a complaint. So don't sit on it, don't wait, get it in as soon as you can. Because, you know, as we've seen this year, 2020 of all years, time flies. So make sure you're really on top of it and you get it in as soon as you can. Um, next important thing to know, and this seems intuitive, but really important to stress nonetheless, is make sure you're documenting everything you possibly can. If this is an ongoing thing or if it was just one incident, you need to really be detailed and diligent you know, with dates, times, names, locations, that sort of thing. If you have any kind of paper trail, like an email trail or physical letters, anything like that, also really key if you have it or if you can get it. And make sure when you're documenting and detailing everything that you're really sticking to the facts and keeping the emotions out of it. Because again, you know, we're dealing with a government agency and they really just want to see the facts. Now, something else that's really important to note as well, and it is a common mistake um, people will make when they are submitting a complaint, is to make sure you're only dealing with the human rights component. You know, if you're dealing with, for example, a workplace incident, you know, and there's also a matter of employment standards or unpaid wages, that sort of thing, that shouldn't play into this complaint that you're filing because it might get kicked back to you. It likely will get kicked back to you and, you know, oh, you have to take this to another board or another agency to have it dealt with because it's not a human right, human rights-based complaint. So now another really important thing to add on that note, since we're talking about employment-based incidents, um, you really need to be clear on, you know, if your workplace is, your workplace or your industry is under federal regulation, then you're going to actually need to file with the Federal Human Rights Commission, not the Alberta Human Rights Commission. So, you know, that could um, make a difference in where you're filing your complaint, just as a little tip. Now, if you need additional help or you're looking for additional resources, there are a couple that I can direct you to here. Um, but if you need additional um, guidance in where to get help for it, you can reach out to the organizers or myself for further info. Now, there is a really good organization here in Calgary and their services are absolutely free. They do strictly deal with uh, helping people submit work-based uh, human rights violations, but they're called, it's helpwrc.org. So you can go check out their website. Um, obviously, quite a few human rights complaints that are submitted are employment-based, but uh, they're a really good resource and they can help point you in the right direction of any other resources you might need. Um, also, another really good one to check out is Legal Aid. Now, they're not 100% free, but they are based on income levels. So uh, definitely a good resource to check out there. Now, the other thing I'm here to talk to you about, uh, I already mentioned before that the UCP has been making some unsavory changes um, in terms of human rights. Now, they're also making other unsavory changes um, to legislation, and I'm not sure if you're already aware but they are they have implemented changes to how municipal elections are run as you know our municipal elections are coming up next fall really soon in fact um now the problem is they're making it incredibly easy for their slate of conservatives to get elected due to some of the legislation changes and incredibly difficult for progressive grassroots candidates to get in. So I'm here to ask for your help with that. Now, there's a few of us that have set up a group to sort of unite volunteers and candidates, and that's albertaelections.com, but it's abelections.com. 
Now, our goal here is to identify some really good candidates that actually want true, genuine, progressive, good change in our cities and in our province. Our fear is that, you know, should the UCP get in on the municipal level, then we're really, really in trouble more than we are now. And there's some amazing candidates that have stepped up to run in their wards, either as counselor or trustee. So if you're at all interested in helping to keep the UCP out on the municipal level, please visit the website. Again, it's abelections.com and reach out to support those candidates in whatever capacity you can, you know, whether it's making phone calls or helping them fundraise, or if you've thought about running yourself, or if you haven't, but now I'm piquing your interest, go and check it out because I can guarantee that most of you are more than qualified to do the job. We genuinely just need real Albertans that understand the real things that we go through day to day to to make real change in our cities and in our rural communities. We, the last thing we need are career politicians coming in and telling us what we need. We can make that the changes that we need to see on the municipal level. And I really encourage you to even consider running. But if that's not for you, there's a lot of great candidates that are truly going to need as much support as we can all give them in the upcoming municipal elections. And I, I really implore you to find uh, the ones that are running in your area that you really align with their values and you can really support. And it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, if you can only volunteer an hour a week or two hours a month, it's still something and it can still make every bit of difference in their campaign. So again, sorry, I'm plugging it a little bit here, but it's abelections.com and we're really just a go-between and we're there to match you up with your candidate in your riding and you can run with it and run the campaign how your candidate needs. Anyway, thank you for listening and I hope to see you out there on the municipal campaign trail. Take care. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm speaking on Treaty 7 land. I am from the community YYC and Inclusive Canada. We have decided to speak on the UCP cuts because they are misleading and immoral. They affect our communities and they treat Alberta like an economy instead of a community. We are a community that has an economy that serves our needs and we play a part in that economy but the plan to continue to maintain the economy instead of putting the needs of people first is drastically affecting the people of Alberta. I would like to base most of my time today on this. I'm going to be reading statements from people, everyday Albertans that were sent in. They will all be anonymous. And I would like to paint a bigger picture about how the UCP cuts are affecting everyday people. So the first says, Alberta didn't close down schools because of the virus. It closed down schools because the province was short over 200 substitute teachers a day and it was impossible to keep the schools functioning and open. Don't delude yourself into thinking Kenny values your child's life. The next says, I think it may be harder to find someone not affected, although people may not realize or be able to articulate it well. The next says, lost about 3K in student funding. Things are tight. I'm in school full time, working as much as I can, but there's only so much I can do. The next, my entire team working in addictions prevention and mental health promotion was cut. 83 years of experience were let go in the midst of a pandemic when we know from the data that COVID has a huge impact on prevalence rates relating to both substance use disorders and mental health. Another. 
He was making life expensive for my family and we up and moved to Saskatchewan. Life is so much cheaper here. My insurance alone was going to jump a hundred annually. Sorry, a thousand annually. That was an 80% increase. Clean driver's record. There's an outbreak in my brother's high school and the UCP won't do anything about it. Rather than name calling the NDP, these people do not give a shit about Albertans' lives. This one is actually sad, I think. Because of Jason Kenney and his cuts to healthcare, my hernia surgery cannot be covered by Alberta because he says it has limited clinical value. I think this comment is very important because of what is happening with the two-tier health system right now. If things are not covered, we have to pay for them. My son lost his in-school psychologist. The psychologist I fought for years to get him, who and when we finally got her, after a, a month school shut down for COVID, then by June she let us know her position was cut. We lost mental health support during the most uncertain time in the world. And I remember when they did that, they said that they were going to cut it while the schools were closed because it was unnecessary. Um, but a lot of families stated that that was not the case, that they needed that mental health support at home, and this is, this is one of those. Um, we had about seven or eight ish responses. I unfortunately cannot read them all due to time, but I'm going to read a few right now. Um, this is very important because they are continually saying that Aish is not changing. Like I said that a few times. Um, but let's continue. But, and you know, that's what they said about the parks. Um, they said they're not selling the parks. Over a third of the parks are no longer going to be parks because they're using wording that is not selling. And I, I think it's just disrespectful, to be honest. Like, it's disrespectful to the people of Alberta to to try and manipulate the words to make things seem one way when they really are another. Like, we expect our politicians to be, to be deceitful, unfortunately, but we don't expect them to be this level. The first H one says, the cuts to education, especially services for special needs children, have a huge impact on my family. My son is 10 and my daughter is 6. Both are on the autistic spectrum. My son needs a full-time EA and support from an OT and a therapist. We have managed to maintain EA support, but no OT and his therapist is no longer allowed in his school because of budget cuts. My daughter is in another school and has autism and a cognitive delay. She did not speak until she was 4. With the help of specialized preschool pro programs that were offered at her school, you would not know that she has a speech delay. She was receiving speech three times a week in pre-K and kindergarten. How in grade one, she maybe has gotten speech three times in the entire year. And each time it's a new person. Could you imagine as a kid trying to build that relationship each time to trust that person? She was also receiving support from an occupational therapist because she has many sensory needs and a huge issue with clothing. She can no longer get the support of an OT. Teachers are trying to fill the gap as best as they can, but they can only do so much. As a family, I do not have $55 an hour for a private speech therapist or another $55 for a private OT. Many families like mine really need the services that are provided by the educational system and now they're not there. The next says, my son wasn't able to get into a group therapy he needed because funding was cut. With the cuts to H, it's possible he won't get the support he needs as an adult either. I'm an RN in mental health waiting for my hospital to go back on the chopping block yet again. I'm looking at losing the pension I've been paying most of my adult life. My 19 year old daughter is asthmatic with a high risk of death because of mismanaged COVID responses. I'm looking to leave the province that has been my home for 20 years. I've lived here longer than the province I was raised in. I planned on retiring here, so now I'm looking to move. I 
Another says, I'm on H. They indexed it, changed the payment dates, lied about their intentions. Don't even get me started on how Kenny speaks on the severely disabled. Another, I'm try I've been trying to get on H for nearly a year. De-indexing it was a bad idea, but now they're changing the criteria to make it harder to qualify. Since there's no treatment for my illness, I'm going to be living in poverty for the rest of my life. Another says I'm on H, cutting the increase tied to inflation, then my van insurance going up with no claims ever has made the food bank has made me need the food bank often. It was rare before. You have to understand that H only gives, I think it's $1,685 a month, and CERB gives $2,000 a month. That's what, that's what they deemed as a livable wage. So the people that are on H are already living um, very in a very constrained way. And for us to, to watch our government make their lives more difficult, I think is something that we do Need to, we need to address, we need to protect our vulnerable populations. This is seniors, this is people on age, this is you know, anyone in those types of, of groups. So again, I can't finish reading all the age ones just due to time, but just a couple smaller comments that came up. Yes, I cannot pay my taxes and mortgage. My mom is losing her job. Uni tuition is killing me. And finally, this per another states, my mental health alone is, may not be enough, but my insurance is way up, my electricity is way up, my school and bus fees for two kids this year has increased almost over $1,800. My doctor is leaving in the new year. My kids are going to be tossed into an archaic new curriculum rather than continue the with a thoughtful one built by over 350 educators and experts, and the list goes on. You know, there's messages in here from people that want to move, people that have to move, people that um, are losing their job, have lost their job, are forced to work in retail when they were previously a teacher. Um, the UCP cuts are affecting us in such a detrimental way as a community and like there was a comment in there that said we may not even notice that the UCP cuts are affecting us, but they are affecting almost everyone. I would just like to take the time to wrap up and touch on a couple things. Why is the UCP doing this? Why is the UCP cutting all this, the social services, education, healthcare? It is because they made poor choices. It is not because they are trying to, like their goal initially was to balance the budget. They have doubled the deficit. And to double it, and then to try and cover up the mistakes that you made by trying to cut corners from social services, education, healthcare, actually not just from those, but from arts, culture, heritage, childcare, everyday, Albertans, education, post-secondary education, environment and parks, healthcare, jobs, justice, municipalities, health, mental health support, senior social programs, workers' rights, and safety, and youth. All of these had multiple cuts underneath them. Now this happened because, for a few reasons, but the UCP dropped 4.7 billion plus dollars into a handful of oil and gas companies. For example, Canadian Natural Resources got 1.6 billion dollars. Um, Suncor got over 1.11 billion dollars, etc. These companies did not provide a rebirth of the economy as was the plan. And instead of publicly speaking on this, Jason Kenney opened a 30 million dollar war room that is supposed to challenge the myths and perceptions on the oil sands. So instead of providing job security, and by that I mean providing new job training for, there is multiple renewable resources in Alberta that he is choosing to stick with, or not just oil sands, but also coal, really speaks to the mindset of Jason Kenney. It is not a progressive mindset. It is not a mindset that will take us 
into 2021 or 2022. It's one that's going to take us back to 1999. And it is important that we move forward. It is important that we ensure that the UCP is accountable. Like when they were audited and lost $1.6 billion, where is that $1.6 billion and how for a government that is treating Alberta like a business, how did they not, how are they not being accountable for this? So, we have some demands. We demand that the UCP be held accountable for disclosing false information, and we further demand the UCP implement ultimate transparency moving forward. The, we demand that the UCP listen to racialized and marginalized communities and implement appropriate solutions. And finally, we demand that the UCP immediately change or remove policies that reduce the standard of living for Albertans. Enough is enough. No more cutting corners. You need to own your mistakes. Trying to rebirth an economy that no longer serves us. And I'm not saying, well, the oil sands is done right now. I'm saying that slowly, ever so slowly, the oil sands is phasing out and renewable resources are phasing in. And if we don't jump on that train now, we're gonna continue in the same boom and bust cycle that Alberta has been in consistently. It's time to make some serious change. And I'm not saying that we need to make drastic change, but I'm saying we need to make accountable and ethical change. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thanks for being here today. And thanks to everyone at YYC Community for organizing this great event. My name is Rory Gill, and I'm a member at CUPE, the Canadian Union of Public Employees. And since March of 2019, I've had the privilege of serving as CUPE Alberta Division President. Now, you'll all have clued in that if I was elected in March of 2019, that was just a little while before Jason Kenney was elected to his current job as Premier of Alberta. And from the moment he was elected, I knew I'd be working flat out every day, fighting back against the policies of the UCP government. Because Jason Kenney spent his entire political career attacking the public sector and the very idea that people are stronger together. During 2019, I had a lot of conversations. I spoke at a lot of rallies and I walked a lot of picket lines and I was always focused on the message that our problems are not because of people who work for others and that we can have a better and more decent society if we unite with each other. Early this year, like all of you, I started hearing about a new disease called COVID-19. And then a week before I had one year in my job as Keep You Alberta president, the lockdown started. The COVID-19 global pandemic is the worst crisis of my lifetime, and it's made many other crises we weren't paying near enough attention to so much more visible. Crises in the healthcare system, long-term care, precarious employment and economic insecurity. And it's revealed that the economic system we live under, capitalism, didn't have a single idea or solution other than to turn to government and the public sector. So right across the country, we have seen different responses to these catastrophic times by different governments. But I can say that when we look at Alberta, I have no problem saying the response of Jason Kenney and his UCP government is the absolute worst. Just before the beginning of the pandemic, they started a fight with doctors over compensation and they've continued this foolish and needless confrontation throughout the fight against COVID, disrespecting doctors and endangering the people they care for. The UCP have also announced that they intend to lay off 11,000 people in the healthcare sector because they say, eh, they don't matter. Anyone can do their work. As governments also dragged their feet protecting the residents and staff of long-term care facilities. And to this day, they have not accessed federal funding to help the people caring for our most vulnerable and improve the care, safety standards, and living conditions in long-term care facilities. At the beginning of the pandemic, they laid off 20,000 education workers when they were needed most, and they continue to underfund education, deny resources to teachers, education assistants, custodians, the Minister of Support workers, and tradespeople. And they aren't content to only attack working people in healthcare, long-term care, and education. And, they, and, and they've introduced an oppressive, regressive, and unconstitutional labor law designed to weaken and silence unions. Good luck with that. And they continue to pretend that there is nothing they can do as a provincial government to protect the lives of Albertans without hurting their livelihoods. 
all they seem to do and want to do is make things worse. Now, we live in Alberta, so some of you might be thinking, yeah, yeah that's true. The UCP is making a terrible situation worse, but that's what the majority want. Now, I've been lived here since I was four years old. I can understand that feeling, but I promise you it isn't true, and it hasn't been for a long while. Now, Kenny did have a big mandate at the last election, but it was based on lies and false promises of prosperity. Every promise he made has been broken, and the people of his province are on to him. Our union, CUPE, has been talking to Albertans, and we know that they do not support the policies of the UCP. We know that 74% of Albertans are against any privatization of health care. We know that 69% of the people who live here support the health care workers who staged a one-day walkout on October 26th to fight back against the attacks on their work and the care they provide to people. And we know that only 3% of Albertans trust Jason Kenney to manage this crisis. It's okay. We're living in terrible times. The government's making it worse. And everybody knows it. What are we supposed to do? Being here today is a huge part of finding a way to share ideas, strategies, and our collective strength. Because it's the strength of many that is going to get us through these terrible times. In QP, we're working to reach out to all our members and let them know they have power and they can stand up to cuts, privatization, and attacks on their fundamental rights. And we can do the same thing right across society here in Alberta. We can focus on organizing against cuts to health, long-term care, and education. We can get in touch with ministers and MLAs on a daily basis to let them know we don't agree and never will agree with their policies. We can get active politically, support Rachel Notley and the NDP as they fight back against Jason Kenney and his government. And we can actively support workers as they say no to rollbacks, service cuts, and privatization by joining their meetings, rallies, and picket lines. We can, in so many ways, say that we don't agree, won't agree, and will never stop fighting for a better world. These actions we take aren't, the, aren't selfish tantrums over whether we're a mask or not. Please wear one. But they're the expression of truly free people working with one another to make sure no one is left behind, no one is alone, and that we all know we're better off when we work together. I want to thank you again for being here today. I hope to see all of you many more times in the days, weeks, and months ahead. And finally, take care of each other during the holidays. Rest up, get ready, and all the best for 2021. Thanks, folks. Hi, I'm Kathleen Ganley. I am the MLA from Calgary Mountain View. I'm here today to talk a little bit uh, to you for Human Rights Day and to talk about the impact that the UCP cuts have had. But I'm going to talk as well about impacts of other actions the UCP have uh, been involved in because it isn't all about saving money. So I think the first thing that we should uh, open with on International Human Rights Day was something they did right away, and that was to roll back the protections for GSAs, because I think that was a major concern. Uh, and it's something that impacts uh, young people at a developmental stage that's incredibly important. So that action, which uh, was not actually an action that saved them any money, um, has had an impact and will continue to have an impact on the rights of people in this province going forward. I think another thing worth mentioning um, is the impact that the UCP have had on women and our participation in the economy. Now certainly the pandemic has had a large portion of this impact as well, but it's worth noting uh, that at every possible turn, the UCP do everything they can to ensure um, that women fighting for representation, fighting for equality, are sort of talked down and seen as, as tokens. Um, for instance, uh, I served for four years as the Minister of Justice, and in that time, two-thirds of the appointments that I made to the bench were women. Those women were eminently qualified. I uh, appointed the first openly LGBTQ woman. I appointed uh, the first Indigenous woman to the bench. And all of those women were just as qualified as any of the men on the applications. But the UCP like to suggest that the reason that we still aren't at 50%, that the reason that 50% of judges still aren't women has something to do with merit. And I think that that's a big concern. There are so many things to talk about here, but I think that the impacts uh, that the UCP has had on the disability community are a huge one. Not only did they roll back 
uh, the indexing of Aish, but they also moved payment dates for no other reason than to appear to have saved money when they actually didn't. And that had a huge impact on the mental health of disabled people throughout our province. Uh, there are many, many things to talk about, but I think the last one I'd like to touch on um, is the changes they're making with respect to the curriculum. Because a fundamental principle of human rights is that we have to understand where everyone is coming from. And removing residential schools and teaching about residential schools from the curriculum has an impact. It has an impact on how people walking around in the world view the Indigenous people in our community because they don't understand the history or the perspective. I think that at the end of the day, everyone wants to, to recognize the equality of all of us. But in order to do that, we need to have an understanding of where people are coming from. And without that information in the school system, it has a huge impact on racism in our province. Thanks very much. And that's our presentation. Um, I hope that you take some time to think about some of the things that the, these people have said tonight. Uh, and if there's any of their, their messages that have particularly resonated with you, look for ways in your, your own world uh, to try to amplify them because they are all very, very important and they are all very, very valid. With that being said, I'd like to just take a minute to talk about something myself. Uh, there's no question that there's been a huge impact on Albertans' lives, not only from the decisions that the UCP government has made, but also from the economic downturn as well as COVID. We've seen lots of examples of how plenty of Albertans are suffering, uh, and there are some really amazing grassroots organizations that go out of their way to try to support Albertans through these difficult times. I just want to give a shout out to a couple of them, and if you have the, the means to support them or even learn about them and promote the work that they do, uh, that would be hugely appreciated by me. Um, so the first one that I want to give a shout out to is the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter. This is an organization that has been around for years and not only do they do incredible work supporting women who are trying to escape abusive situations, but they also do a lot of proactive education to try to prevent abusive situations from even happening in the first place. They're an amazing organization that I've personally supported for uh, years and years and years and I would definitely encourage you to take a look at them. The other organization that I want to give a shout out to is Be The Change YYC. Uh, that organization was started by a gentleman named Chaz Smith that we interviewed a little while back. And they do some incredible outreach work in making sure that homeless Albertans have some supports and have uh, access to uh, food and clothing uh, and all kinds of different things, as well as help to steer them in directions where they can get further supports. Uh, they're an entirely grassroots organization and they're an amazing group of people. So if you have a sec to take a look at their Facebook page or their uh, Twitter, I definitely encourage you to, to check them out. The last group that I want to give a shout out to is probably some of the most amazing people uh, in Calgary, and they're called the Dope Team. Uh, they almost lost their funding earlier in the year because of cuts that had happened, but fortunately, Albertans and Calgarians stepped up and made sure that they got the, the funding that they need to continue to do the work. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the Dope Team, uh, they go to places where homeless people need assistance. They provide that assistance. They provide transport. They get them to shelters. Uh, these are some of the most patient and kind people that I've ever had the privilege to encounter. Uh, and I, I just can't say enough good things about them. So if you're looking for another organization to consider supporting, please take Take a look at the dope team. Uh, they do amazing, amazing, amazing work. Um, I want to take a second and thank everybody again for their attention and their time watching our little presentation tonight. Um, so thank you very much for that. Happy holidays and stay safe. <laughs>